Welcome to Born Katamut United Methodist Church home service on this Sunday. I want to say on behalf of the entire uh, worship team, particularly uh, Pastor Tim, Sue and Tom Gu, Joe Burns and Vicki, who are working in the background, and Tatiana with her absolutely stunning piano piece that she shared with us today. And just seeing all your faces in the slideshow, um, I know I speak on behalf of everyone. We miss you so much, but thank you for letting us come into your home, and we hope you have a blessed day. Thought for the week. Never doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. Raymond Edmund. Let's begin, let's begin our service by saying responsibly Psalm 16. Oh, with you in the Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom in all my, in all, is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Oh, with you in the fountain of life, in your voice we say light. Let us now sing the day of resurrection.
the opening prayer and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Let us say this in unison. Dear Lord, as we come before you in worship, open the eyes of our hearts to your presence. Open our lives to the breath of your spirit. Help us trust in you and receive your gift of new life with gratitude. We pray through Jesus Christ, your son, our savior. Amen. And we continue in prayer together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we listen for God's word. Our first reading is Acts 2, verses 14a and 22 to 32. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an, on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what has to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to it. Let us now sing Christ is Risen. Thank you. 
Our second reading today is 1 Peter, first, cha first chapter, verses 3 through 9. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Good morning. We have such a treat for you today. We have two children joining children's time, Kathy Tibbetts' grandson, Grayson, and my grandson, Owen. So without further ado, here's our story, No David and our very special guests. No, no, Dan. No, David. No, David by David Shannon. And in today's um, lesson, Bye. today's lesson at church, they're talking about forgiveness, forgiving people. Do you know what that means? Owen, do you know what forgiving somebody means? Yeah, you, you apologize. You apologize? Yeah, that's good. Sorry is what I said. Well, that's right, Owen. Sorry is another way to ask for forgiveness. That's a good answer. Well, these are some of the things that David does. You don't do this, do you? No. David's mom always said, no, David. She didn't want him writing on the walls, did she? Oh, no. She's saying, no, David, because he's about to knock the fishbowl over. And then she says, David, David, no, be careful of the cookie jar. You'll spill it. Oh, and this is the worst one. David, what are you doing? You're so muddy and messy. And this is my favorite one. David, you're sloshing the water all over the bathtub. And no, don't run out the street with no clothes on, David. Come back, come back. Now, I know you boys would never do this. He is jumping on the bed. And you know what his mom says? She goes, settle down, David, settle down. And now he's watching TV and she says, Put your toys away, David. Put them away. And do you think he puts them away? I don't think so. She's going, no, David. No, so, no, no. We're going to see the end in just a few minutes, but I want to ask you a question. So how many things can you think of? Because let's say David, let's say I'm David's mother. And <laughs> I am really going to be upset with all the things that David did. What, what are some of the things he did? Who can remember? Oh, oh. Just tell him. Yeah. Um, he, 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 he jumped on his bed. He jumped on his bed. One thing that mommy is mad about. Okay, what else? <laughs> um, Owen? He, um, he ran outside naked. He ran yeah. outside naked. Yes, that was terrible. All right, here's another thing his mom is mad about. How about you, Jason, uh, Grayson? Okay. Um... <laughs> He writing on the wall. He was writing on the wall. Good. How about you, Owen? Um, he he watched TV about cleaning up his mess. Yes, yes. You would never do that, would you? Yeah. 
All right. How about you, Kristen? Um, knocking the fishbowl over. Yes. Yes, knocking the fishbowl over. Wow, oh, no. she's getting really upset. Mm -hmm. Owen? I we have two more. Oh, Remember he's reaching, reaching, reaching up for the cookie jar? Yeah. Yep. And oh, one more wow. thing. What else? Get, getting messy. Muddy, right? Yeah. All right. So David's mother is so mad. She has all these mad things that she has to carry around, right? Uh huh. Let's see what she does about it. Let's see what she does. Okay, so first she does. No, David, go to the naughty chair, right? <laughs> is he sitting in the naughty chair? Uh huh. He looks pretty upset, right? But then you know what mommy does? She says, Come here, David. Come here. What do you think he wants to do? He wants to hug him. He wants to hug, right? And she says, I love and forgive you, David. I love and forgive you. So she gets to take all <laughs> these things off because she forgave him. And if she didn't, she'd have to carry them off. Oh, thank goodness. She'd have to carry them all around all day. Oh, no. And this is the end of the story. Yeah. And no, no, David, no. Yeah, it looks like he's going to continue to get in trouble, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. All right. So you understand that it's important yeah. to not stay mad if somebody hits you and you go, well, every time I see you, I'm going to hit you or I'm going to not invite you to a party, right? Yeah, you need to say, I'm not happy that you hit me, right? You don't have to say it's okay, but you have to say, I'm not going to stay mad at you, okay? But don't do it again. Otherwise, you've got to carry that anger with you all the time. That's what you want. All right, anything else you want to tell me? Why does David be bad? Yeah, I know. Somebody wrote in to the person who wrote the book and said, how old is David? How old do you think he is? Um, maybe 20. 20? <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, uh, maybe six. Six, like your age? Five. 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 Younger I'm than I'm older you. than you. I'm yeah. older. Yeah, you guys are older than that, so... Yeah, maybe he's just younger and his mom's trying to teach him not to do stuff, right? But he is particularly bad sometimes, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, he's very bad. Well, you know what? That's all I want from you guys. You were very helpful. Thank you for your time. Let us now sing Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
Our gospel reading picks up where we left off last week, in chapter 20 of John's Gospel, verses 19 now through 31. Hear the word. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. Disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop disbelieving and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Peace be with you. It's been a lot easier for me this year to identify with those first disciples of Jesus huddled together behind locked doors in self-imposed isolation due to fear of threats outside the doors. In some previous years, I've held them up to a little bit of more scrutiny and questioned their faithlessness in locking those doors. But this year, I'm with it. I'm with it. Most of us, like those disciples of old, have been wondering what comes next. Wondering how to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ risen from the dead in such a time as this. A time when accounts of sickness and death seem to roll unceasingly through the news reports we hear and see every day. Which is a big, big reason why it is so very, very good for me to hear again. This peace be with you message, Jesus speaks. As he passes through locked doors to come into our presence, with the message he speaks again now a second time, saying again, peace be with you. Disciples huddled in an upstairs room need to hear these words more than once. Probably most of us need to hear the message more than once too. Our hearts long for the peace of God that comes through Jesus Christ especially in these days when peace, the peace of Jesus, can often seem rather elusive. So as Jesus shares his peace, he also shares, shows his disciples the wounds of the cross embedded in his hands and his side, reminding us of where he's been and what he's been through, assuring us again he has risen, risen indeed from the dead. Up from the grave, Christ has arisen. Now he lives forever with his saints to reign. Yet the unhealed scars of the nails of the cross and the spear thrust into his side are still seen. All the more welcome than his words, as Jesus says a second time, peace be with you. This is such shockingly good, good news that his disciples really can't be faulted. They're not catching all the shadings of meaning he is communicating to them as he says, and as the Father has sent me, now I send you. 
breathes on them his breath of life, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. The breath of God, the breath of Jesus here, a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, the breath of life, one breath we should never fear even in a pandemic. The disciples may not yet notice the parallel here with God the Father breathing life into the first human creature in the garden in the beginning. Later for sure they will understand, but for now, disciples are probably just so very overjoyed with seeing Jesus alive, hearing him say words like those he spoke on that last long night before the cross, peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you that they're not really making all the connections yet, just soaking, bathing in the joy of seeing and hearing Jesus alive. They have heard Mary Magdalene reporting earlier that day on her visit to his grave early in the morning, his grave in the garden where his body had been laid out and sealed tight in the tomb. They've heard Mary say, I have seen the Lord. Now they have seen for themselves. But when Thomas, who famously was not there that first Easter evening with them, returns, and they say to him, Now what Mary had said to them, We have seen the Lord, Thomas isn't buying it. He says he's got to see those wounds of Jesus for himself and see it's not even enough. He'd have to touch the wounds of Jesus to believe he's really risen from the dead. Thomas just might be the author of that old, old saying, don't believe anything you hear or half of what you see. He is, after all, the original Doubting Thomas. And there's never been any shortage of Doubting Thomases. I'd be surprised, though, since Thomas the Doubter has gotten a bad rap, I'd be surprised to hear any believer in Jesus say we're imitating him deliberately, but I'd also be surprised to say hear anybody say they've never ever been anything like Thomas, never felt any shakiness in faith in Christ, even when the storms of life are raging. In fact, I expect usually to hear the opposite. Those with the strongest faith are usually the first to acknowledge the doubts and the struggles they encounter in their life of faith, their life of hope, their life of trust in Jesus. People of faith often speak of believing and doubting in the same breath. I've been reminded of Emily Dickinson, a poet of Amherst in the 1800s, who some doubt was a person of faith, but many others are very, very sure she was a person of faith. She wrote once in a letter to a friend, this is back in the 1800s, we both believe and disbelieve a hundred times an hour, which keeps believing nimble. Real doubt is not the opposite of faith. Honest doubt is an integral part of faith, as has often been observed through the centuries by people of faith. Doubt isn't really even the issue today, as our closest English language equivalent for the word Jesus uses in today's episode is disbelief, not doubt. According to many Bible commentaries, I did cross-check. But because so many, many contemporary Bible translations do use the word doubt in John 20, doubt is therefore part of our conversation today. An author, pastor, and Lutheran seminary Bible scholar and professor Mark Allen Powell, in his book, Loving Jesus, not one of his scholarly books, but one of his devotional books, has been especially helpful for me this week as he points out um, and it points to another after the resurrection scenes over in Matthew's gospel, where the word doubt is the proper wording. In that case, Matthew 28. Here in Matthew, the remaining 11 of the original 12 disciples are worshiping Jesus and doubting at the same time. Now, most translations in English virtually hide this plain meaning of the doubt there, saying they worshiped him, but some doubted, Matthew 28, 17. But the original text Powell tells us actually says they worshipped him and doubted at the same time. Powell, a highly respected Matthew scholar, asked some translators he knew why they had added the words but some when the text clearly actually only says they worshipped and doubted. One translator answered, 
The verse wouldn't make any sense otherwise. No one can worship and doubt at the same time. Thou says, I invited this fellow to visit a Lutheran church. We do it all the time. Methodist too, in my experience, it's really not so hard to do. I've done it plenty of times. Most believers, most of the time, I suspect, are probably often worshiping and doubting at the same time. That's probably even a good thing. Honest doubt makes for good questions. Good questions make for good pondering and struggling. With some of the many answers that come with investigation of our healthy doubts and questions. For sure, God knows there's many things we should doubt. A few weeks ago, I bought a refurbished laptop computer online and paid for two days mail delivery. The computer famously never came. After a flurry of unanswered emails and phone calls and several hours of documenting my efforts to cancel the sale, I finally did persuade my credit card company, cancel that transaction, refund the money. I should have doubted from the first the claims of that company. I should have done more fact-checking. I could have spared myself a lot of frustration. But I got off lightly. We were to follow every bad piece of advice on the internet and television over the past eight weeks. A lot more people would be sick and dying than at present. Fortunately, nearly all health professionals around the world have rallied together with the message, stay inside except for necessary trips and healthy walks with proper spacing and masks, etc. Doubting those who have given and sometimes still continue to give contrary advice to what the health professionals say is life-saving wisdom. We do well to doubt those who disagree. Healthy, informed doubt, doubt mixed with lots of prayer and sufficient study and consultation is a gift from God. What's not good, what's not from God, is to confuse healthy doubt about ourselves and our fellow humans with unhealthy disbelief in God. We can doubt many things and worship at the same time, but trying to worship God while disbelieving in God at the same time is not gonna work. Disbelieving, not doubting, is what Jesus tells Thomas to quit doing. What's the difference in real life between doubting and disbelieving? Again, Mark Allen Powell's been helpful as he says, True doubt, quote, true doubt is what someone experiences when they are trying to believe, but can't quite get there. Thomas, he says, does the opposite. He tries not to believe. Jesus rebukes, end quote. Rebukes Thomas for not trying, not for not trying, but for trying not to believe. That's what Thomas is rebuked for, not for doubt. Now the harder part, of course, again in real life can be discerning the borders between genuine healthy doubt and stubborn, stubborn, persistent disbelieving. Refusing to believe what God has shown us in the light of his son, Jesus Christ. Healthy doubt and healthy faith can go together naturally. May not, we may not always like it. It can be like the colder weather we've had this week after those beautiful warm days a few weeks ago and a week ago even. Whichever way the weather turns though, it's still spring in New England. The scythia and spring flowers are in beautiful bloom. Azaleas are opening, displaying their extravagant color. Those snowflakes that some of us saw last Thursday, yes, they were real which is a pretty good metaphor for how I have been experiencing this early season of Easter so far. So quickly after the rush of joy of seeing Jesus risen, I'm having to realize we are going to have to keep learning to live with the somber feelings that we hoped would be left behind as Lent gives way to the Easter season. As every day, news keeps reminding us we've got a while, maybe a lot longer while, to go before things begin to get better, then still further to go before we can even begin to know what's next, which for me has been discouraging. So I'm thanking God all the more for 
Jesus interrupting the isolation of our souls, entering into the secret places of our hearts, showing again his wounds, reminding us of what's most important. As the Father sent me, now I send you. Jesus tells us, reminding he's, us he is counting on us to continue the work he has begun here on earth. The work of believing in him, and loving and caring for this broken world that God so loves, that he sent his only son, who offers his peace, grace, love, and salvation freely to all, so all who believe in him may not perish, but have eternal life, eternal love, eternal joy, eternal peace. And in this revealing of his wounds, Jesus reminds us again of his deep, deep love for all this suffering world. Reminds us again, as we believe, we will follow him. As we follow, we share his sorrows, as well as his deepest joys. Sometimes sorrows and joys mixed all together, like rain and sunshine, doubt and believing. So it is in this chilly yet joyful still early Easter season, it's not so surprising, not so surprising after all, that it turns out to be disbelieving Thomas himself. He speaks the very best confession of who Jesus is in all the Gospels as he exclaims, my Lord and my God. Yes, Jesus still scolds him for trying to avoid believing. But Jesus also includes Thomas for sure, as he says now a third time, peace be with you. Jesus invites Thomas to touch as he's requested. Bible doesn't say if he did or not. I sure hope he didn't, but either way, Jesus for sure keeps loving Thomas, just as he keeps loving me and you, loving all of us, through all of our doubt, disbelief, weak faith, strong faith, messy, mixed up, confused faith, any faith we've got will be enough, as long as we don't ever give up on believing in Jesus, who is still here with us saying, keep believing, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
As we begin our time together in prayer and praise, let us start with a moment of silent reflection and praise. Lord God, we thank you so much for every blessing, blessings beyond measure. We thank you for our friends, our family, our loved ones, your church. We thank you for the homes we have, the roofs over our heads, clothes on our backs, and the food on our tables. We thank you for the loving community we are part of, by faith and by grace. continue to thank you and praise you throughout the day and throughout the week. We lift up our prayer concerns to you. We pray again for this parish, Lord God, that we are part of, for the churches of Katamin and Born, all the members thereof, those nearby and those farther away. We continue to pray for your church universal, all denominations, of which we are a part. Bless and guide and lead us, O Lord, we ask. We pray for our neighbors, next door and next door to them, on all sides this block and down the block and around the block. Our neighbors, Lord, we lift you. All those we know by name and those we don't know yet by their location, we pray, Lord God, your blessing, your health and healing. We pray for our sick and our ill and our shut-ins. Pray for those who are grieving loss of a loved one. For us at Connie Odom Soper most recently. Lift up those in hospital or in health facilities who need our prayers, lifting especially this week. Deanie, Mary Dean Caldwell, and Millie, Millie Perry. And each of us will be lifting others whom we are particularly connected with, or connected to whom. We lift up all the healthcare workers, nurses, CNAs, staff, and doctors, and all the first responders, police and the fire departments, the ambulance drivers and orderlies, EMTs, many, many others. Lift up those in essential services, those who are working the cash registers and bagging groceries, stocking the shelves, keeping life going, pumping gas, all of the things we take for granted. Thank you for those whose work and whose prayers keep life going. We pray for our Commonwealth of Massachusetts and our town of Bourne. We pray for the nation. We pray for all leaders in every realm of life, elected officials, religious leaders, economic leaders, at every level. We pray wisdom, we pray guidance, we pray good decision-making for the common good for the many, not just the few. We pray for your grace and your love to triumph. We pray for the community of nations as we pray for our own nation. We thank you that the bonds of faith and grace are stronger than the bonds of family and nation even. In Christ, we are one people. We lift up again those in authority, those who lead in any 
area or aspect of life. We pray for all of us, extra wisdom, extra discernment, extra grace, and extra peace. Today we heard our Lord Jesus say to us, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. Three times we've heard that in our gospel reading today. May we carry these words with us and share them with others throughout the week, every week. These and all the prayers of our hearts we lift the strong, powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our friend. Amen. Please sing shalom to you with me. to think about your offering and then let us sing the doxology. prayer of dedication in unison with me. Thank you, gracious and generous Lord, for the blessing of being able to contribute to the work of your church and your kingdom. May all our offerings and all our lives bring you joy and bring us peace. We pray in the holy name of Jesus, Savior of the world. Amen. We go forth with prayer and singing.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord our God. Share the good news of Jesus Christ any way you can, all the ways you can. God be with you till we meet again.